you know, uh, there's a guy who, there's a cowboy who was going down the road one time, and, and he had his faithful dog in the back of the truck, and behind him, he was pulling a horse trailer, and he had a horse that he loved in the trailer, and he was just driving, and, and there was a corner, and he was navigating the road, and he unnavigated the corner. He didn't go around it right, and he crashes and tumbles, and, and things don't go well. The poor cowboy is lying in the front of the truck, and a highway patrol officer soon comes up and sees the carnage, and he's an animal lover, this highway patrol officer, and he walks up, he sees the horse, the horse has a couple broken leg, and it's just not going to do well. And so he does what they always do to a horse. They, he takes out his revolver and <laughs> shoots the horse. And then he comes up and he sees the dog. The dog was laying in the street. The dog wasn't doing well. The dog wasn't going to get better. And he comes up and he, the animal lover that he is, he puts the dog down. And he comes up to the cowboy in the front. He says, how you doing, sir? The cowboy says, I've never been better. <laughs> you know, and sometimes... You know, even though he has broken bones, sometimes you've just never been better. You know, we, sometimes we complain about things and, and because accidents happen, right? We've all been there. We've all been hurt. We've all had some accidents happen. We've all known of people have been accidents. But, but a lot of times when big accidents happen, we tend to ask the question, where is God when bad things happen? Where is God when bad things happen? Or better yet, where is God when bad people do bad things? That's a question that we ask in 2023. That's a question that has been asked, and that's, as I've just watched some videos, a, a scientist is going, you know, I'm having problems believing in God, because how could a loving God allow those bad things to happen to those people? And the text we're going to look at this morning, I think Jesus is going to talk a little bit about that. If you've been around for a while, we're in Luke chapter 13, and in Luke chapter 13, we're almost smack dab in the middle of the book of Luke, 24 chapters in Luke or at Luke 13, 1. Jesus has been walking around. He's been preaching, and crowds are around him. And we've also learned in the course of the time that this book was not written to Californians in 2023. It was written originally by Luke, and it was written to Theophilus, Theophilus and, and he has the two volumes to this book. He has Luke 1 through 24, and then he has the book of Acts. And so he's writing this book, these letters, to a very specific person in a very specific point of time. And I hope that we've understood that. And so we then take, what would they say there and how would they respond? What, do they, what are they thinking? And we then say, that's true. How do we then translate and interpret that for our times today? See, we ask, where is God? We ask this question. We ask this question, where is God when bad things happen? Where is God when bad people do bad things? That's not the question that the Jewish people would ask. That is not how they would understand that thing because they're, they're, God was everywhere. They were under the constant and continual umbrella of God's judgment. They would never, ever ask, where is God? Instead, they would ask this when something bad happens. Who sinned, this man or his parents? Who sinned? Who, what happens when bad thing happens? It, it's a result of that person's sin. That's why something bad happens. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. And so if you're a crippled person, we'll look at it a little bit later. Well, of course she's demon-possessed. If you're, wi if you're widowed, if you're blind, well, Jesus is walking around. There's a blind gal, and Peter says, who sinned, this woman or her parents? They see bad things happening to people who are bad, who are sinful, because they see the constant, continual judgment of God in every person. We tend to say, where is God? They know where God is. God is judging that. He's judging that accident. He's judging that situation. He's judging that moment. And that person obviously had sin in their life. Don't believe me. Read the book of Job. Is that not what his three friends spend 30 chapters trying to accuse him of? There's sin in your life, Job. And if you're a righteous person, you would just admit that and move on. That's a... That's a read throughout all of the Old Testament, God's continual judgment. Luke 13. In Luke 13, we're going to see Jesus sort of addresses this. But he doesn't address it like we try to address it. Where is God? He addresses it by pointing his finger at us. Not at that bad thing that happened to that person. Not at that accident that we'll look at that happened over there. 
but he uses it as a great teaching moment. There are two scenes we're going to look at, the beginning of chapter 13. Two quick vignettes to enter, introduce verse 1 and verse 3, quick vignettes to happen in the theme. Someone does something bad. This is the first vignette. Someone does something bad. Jesus is teaching. As we know in the last couple of weeks, there's a crowd of people. Chapter 12, verse 1, there's a crowd. They're, they're stepping on top of each other. This is now going to be the second time, or the third time, I'm sorry, that Jesus is interrupted. He's interrupted yet again. It says this, verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. We know nothing else about what was going on here. We know that there is Pilate. Pilate, we know, is the one who's, who ultimately sends Jesus to the cross. Pilate was a ruthless man. But here's some Galileans, and the Galileans are probably going to Jerusalem, and they were probably, they were probably going to present their sacrifice. Our vision of them would be they would be the pious, they'd be the righteous, they'd be the religious, they'd be the ones who say, God, God, forgive me. God, here I am, I have messed up, or God, you are worthy of this sacrifice. They're, they're the good guys. They're, they're the people that you would think, well, those are the righteous people. Those are the holy ones. Those are the, the good. They went and they were presenting sacrifice. And for some reason, we don't know. There's no other text that tells us. For some reason, Josephus has a kind of a story you might have to take um, with a grain of salt in his story of it. For some reason, Pilate kills them. In our culture today, we would look at Pilate. We go, what an evil person that Pilate is. These innocent people. What does Jesus say? Jesus says this. He answered them who interrupted, and he said, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Do you think, uh, he's addressing that issue, who sinned, this man or their parents, he's addressing those Galileans who were there sacrificing. Are they sinful? How sinful are they? Are they worse sinners than everybody else in Galilee? And by the way, the people in Jerusalem tend to look down their nose at the Galileans. They were from the outside. They were from, they were from Colton. You know, they were, they, were the, they were the outsiders. You know, we're not part of Los Angeles. We're, we're kind of snubbed. We're the part of the 909 area code, right? Oh, yeah. No. Look at what he does. You. You. I tell you, unless you repent. You will all likewise Wow. Hey, who sinned? Jesus, what's going on? Those Galileans, they, they were sacrificing, and Pilate had them killed right there in the sacrifice. He's going, is everybody else in Galilee? Are they all innocent? Are these three people worse than them? And Jesus says, unless you repent, you all will likewise perish. In other words, do you think you're better than those people God judged at that moment? Jesus is now getting at the heart of our judgmental attitude, of, a, of our judgmental attitude of people who are suffering hard times, how we look at them, how we think about them. Do you think you are better than those people God judged at that moment? There's a professor, he's a, past, he's a professor of pastoral studies at Trinity College. He's the author of many commentaries on the Bible. He says this, the fact is we are all sinners. We are all in need of repentance. We are all deserving punishment and all persevered from the wrath of God at least until Judgment Day through his mercy. All of us, every single one of us, we're no better than those guys who were pious, who were, who were religious, who were righteous, presenting their sacrifice, and all of a sudden, Pilate kills them. Judgment. They, they live under the umbrella of judgment, continual judgment, being held accountable for their sins, for their walking away from God, for their disobedience to what he has told them. Jesus, he didn't do what we did. We tend to compare sin. Jesus did not compare sin. He didn't say, oh, man, Pilate is such a horrible guy, and these guys are all innocent. He didn't compare. He's just flat out saying that everybody, everybody sins. Everybody, everybody is alive simply because of the mercy of God. 
if we were to look at his holiness. Second wrong. First wrong. Uh, three Galileans are, are slaughtered, sacrificing to God by Pilate. Second issue. Now, this is where an accident happened. Bad things happen. Uh, some guys, Jesus, we don't know anything about this story as well. Or, verse 4, those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? We don't know what happened here. All we know is there's a tower, and the tower, it collapsed. And when it collapsed, were they workers on the tower? Was this an accident job? And, And all of a sudden, the tower collapsed as they were working on it? 18 people died. 18 people died. Were they worse than anyone else in Jerusalem? And so if you think who sinned, this man or this mom, his mom, his parents, his dad, and you see someone dead, what do you do? Oh, this guy's getting the judgment of God. Of course, you're going to walk the straight and narrow, right? Of course, you're going to walk right. You're going to write, oh, you're going to be pretty judgmental and judging. We don't know what happened. But we do know that they looked at those 18 and said, well, God's judgment fell on them. They never asked, where is God? Instead, they said, God's judgment fell right on them. And Jesus says, look where he's pointing the finger. Look at what he's doing. He's not talking about, talking about the accident. He says, I tell you, unless you repent, you all will likewise perish. Wow. A horrible situation where an evil man creates an atrocity inside of a, of a religious sacrificial system, the Jewish temple probably. Another, another incident where, where 18 guys are working on a tower and the tower collapses and they get killed. And Jesus is saying, you're going to be judged likewise. Wow, unless you repent. See, Jesus demands sin will be punished and God will judge us all. That's what he's saying. Sin will be punished. Sin. We've all got it. And so he talks about repentance, and so I'm going to explain a little bit about repentances. And I want you to listen. I want you to hear, is there, and, and is there something today that you need to repent of. Did God bring you here so that you could he could speak to you about an issue in your life that you need to say, God, I'm sorry. I repent. Three parts to repentance. Part one. That is the confession of it. You need to just confess. So I I'll get an I'll show you what you need to confess of in a minute. But think of confession as first you need to admit it. There is a, a side, a mental side, an intellectual side that goes, yes, that's right. Yes, that's wrong. I, I disobeyed God, where you actually know intellectually that what you're doing is wrong. So you confess it. There's an intellectual side of it. Second, there's a contriteness of it. Your heart is moved. There's an emotional aspect. The heart is moved. Yes, oh God, I'm so sorry. You know in your brain you did something wrong. You know in your heart that it's wrong. Then there's a third aspect of it, a change in direction. A lot of people stop there. They confess their sin. They know it's wrong. And they continue to live in it. The actual idea of repentance is a third aspect. There's a change in direction. A lot of times the illustration is that of a U-turn. But you've got to change. You've got to stop doing what you've been doing Maybe looking at what you've been looking, talking what you've been talking, listening to what you've been listening to, thinking about what you've been thinking, fantasizing, whatever it is, you've got to change. You actually have to change. Uh, and then I thought of the ABCs so that we get this, the ABCs of repentance. A is you need to admit. You just, just talk about it. You need to admit, you need to know that it's sinful and that it is a Offensive to God what you're doing. Until you realize, until you admit that what you're doing is wrong. When I've gone to the AA meetings because they were here and I had to do it as a requirement of seminary, they say, hi, my name is Paul and I'm an alcoholic. They've got to admit it. Until you first admit that, hi, I'm Paul, I'm a sinner. This is my sin. God, I, I, I'm sorry. Then you have to believe in your heart that you have offended God, that what you have done 
is an offense to the holiness of God. And then you have to cease. Cease, stop, quit, repent, let go. You don't like the three C's, you don't like that, let's try M to the third. The M to the third of repentance. I could go on for days making up these, <laughs> these things, right? You've got to mark it as wrong. You gotta, I'm sorry, that shouldn't be great. You've got to mark it as wrong. It is wrong. What I am doing is marking it as wrong, that I'm going to mourn it as dead. 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 Your, your sin is death, and you're, you're continually dwelling in the realm of death when you're living in sin. Not living in the light as God is the light, but you're living, you're choosing, you're purposefully engaging in activities that are sinful. It's dead. Stop playing with dead stuff. And then you've got to maintain it as a friend. Nobody's going, huh? No. Okay. Not maintain it as a friend. I've just seen how awake you all were, right? Whew. Pastor Paul, what are you doing? Okay. You move as though it's contagious. Mark it as wrong, mourn it as dead, and move as though contagious. It, it, it is, it is contagious. You'll start to grow immune to its power. To, and you'll start to just rationalize and justify and explain your behavior as being okay unless you mourn it as dead, unless you move away as though it's contagious. The Apostle Paul says this, He's writing to a church, and he's writing to a church, and in the first part of his letter, he talks about the Gentiles. The Gentiles are all, they don't know God's word. It's just written on their hearts, but the Jewish people that are there, oh, they have the prophets, they have the letters, they, they, they've, they've got the promises. And he talks about how both of them have failed God. And then he says that everyone has sinned, fallen short of the glory. It doesn't matter what your biological past is, every single person has failed the glory of God. Everyone needs to repent. Everyone in this room. Repentance needs to be a, a practice that we do continually, constantly. Thinking about those things that God brings to your mind because, because it's easier to confess when they're fresh and go, okay, I'm done, than if it's a rut that you've been driving in for such a long time. I don't know, have you ever ridden your bike into a rut and then you try to turn your bike out of a rut or, or, and, and you can't get out and you end up falling and tumbling? Ever ridden your bike across a train track? Well, you, you get in that rut and you're done with? When we've been living in a pattern and it's hard to get out, that's, repentance is hard. It's so much easier if it's just a continual thing we practice, changing and saying, God, God, I'm being lured. Oh, no, I'm going to change my thoughts, going to change my friends going to change what I'm watching, going to change those things that I am addicted to. A couple of years ago, probably many years ago, I did a sermon series out of a book by Jeff Bridges. And, and the book has, it was, he worked for the Navigators years ago. I know that Rich back there was with the Nav, or participated in Navigators when he was just a wee little lad. And, and so Jeff, Jeff Bridges, he wrote this book called Respectable Sin. A lot of times when we're talking about sins, maybe we're thinking about the big things. I'm going to give you 12 things, all biblical things, that maybe you need to repent of. 12 things in which you go, well, okay, you know, I'm not a pedophile. I'm not committing adultery. I'm okay. Really. Sin of anxiety. Worrying. Being anxious. Just, just giving in to anxiety. Matthew, Jesus says, Jesus says in Matthew, therefore do not worry. Do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles on its own. And yet, we as Christians feel comfortable. Oh man, I'm so worried about this. I'm so anxious about that. Sometimes we live in the rut of anxiety. We live there. And we refuse to get out. We refuse to, to, to say, God, God, I'm, I'm being anxious. Will you help me in this moment of anxiety? You don't bring along any friends. You don't confess it to anybody else. You just live in that rut. In other words, church, there are sometimes you're living in sin. 
and we freely broadcast that to everybody we come across. I'm so worried. Sin of discontentment. Philippians 4 says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstance. Hebrews says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God had said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. And so many times, we share our discontentment thinking that God has forsaken us. We've got the rut. We're living in it. We need to repent from being discontent. We need to repent from the sin of unthankfulness. Talking with somebody this week, and I was challenging them to pray for somebody and give thanks for that person in their life, and that was so hard. The person had hurt them, and they needed to learn how to give thanks. First Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances, not just the good ones. Romans 1, for although they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, nor give thanks. You know, in a couple of weeks, we have Thanksgiving coming. Will we be thankful? Are we thankful for those trials that come our way, for those people that, that challenge us to think differently? Thankful. The sin of being unthankful. Sin of pride. Pride goes before the destruction, a haughty spirit before the fall. But he gives more grace. That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud. Boasting, arrogance, thinking that you're better than other people simply because whatever, name it, pride, arrogance, sin of selfishness. Do nothing out of selfishness or vain conceit, but rather in humility think of others as better than yourself. Selfishness. You've got to go first in life. You've always got to go first. You, you don't let somebody else get the food before you do. It, you've always got to be first in line. You've always got to get there. It, and selfishness, you need want more and more and more. Sin of selfishness. Instead of dying to self and serving, and generously taking every moment to serve as an opportunity to allow God to work. The sin of lack of self-control. How's your eating habits? Your finances? Your hobbies? Your social media use? This last week, I've been listening to a lot of speeches in my class. And in my class, I've been trying to give persuasive speeches. Some are much more persuasive than others. Some were shorter than they should have been, too. I could, I could go on a long time about some of the stuff I've heard, but there are many students that talked about the issues of social media. The last thing, the last thing they see before they close their eyes is social media, whether it's TikTok or whether it is Instagram or whatever social media site it is. But then the very first thing they pick up, oh, what's going on? They have watches that vibrate every time they get a, every time someone posts something on their social media. Social media. It's a lack of self-control. You're in a conversation, and, and you get a TikTok notification, and so all of a sudden you look at the TikTok, and you forget the friend. Does social media have your heart? It, it, do you show a lack of self-control? Can you monitor that? Many times they've said during a class, they said, well, pick up your phone and see how many hours on social media you've been there. You know, they're, they're doing six or seven hours a day on social media, on their phone. Wow. And they're not engaging in friendships and relationships. They're not doing things that build themselves up. Is that just an application for college students? Or is it also an application for adults that are in this church? Sin of impatience. But the fruit of the Spirit, we'll come back to this a couple of times. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, peace. What is it? Patience, 
lack of patience means you're lacking a fruit, singular fruit, fruit of the Spirit. If you probably are lacking patience, you probably are not exhibiting love. You're probably not displaying joy. You probably don't have any peace. And yet we broadcast that. Sin of anger. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict. Is there conflict in your home? Is there conflict in your house? Conflict amongst your friends? And is it because of anger? Sins of resentment, bitterness, and animosity. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows to cause him trouble and to defile him. Are you letting things in your heart embitter you? And do you gladly talk about them and share with them? Bitterness, resentment. Maybe somebody hurt you years ago and, and you still hold resentment and animosity, hatred towards that person. Oh, the sin of judgmentalism. Do not judge or you will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged with the same measure you use. You will be judged. You will be measured. How are you at judging other people? Who sinned? Who sinned? Uh, This person just, just something bad happened to him. Well, there must be some sin. Oh, I'm judging. Must be some sin in their life. Do we learn nothing from the book of Jude? The sister sins, envy, and jealousy. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. You are still worldly, Paul says. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere the assumption is that we've got the Spirit of God living in us and that we should be different than our neighbors who don't know Jesus. Envy, jealousy, sins of the tongue. Sins of the tongue. See, see, I'm pulling, all I'm pointing out is these are respectable sins. These are sins that, that you know, the world goes and we go, well, we're not going to put him in jail for that. And God's standard is so much higher than our standard. Uh, I don't have anything to repent of, you might have thought when you came in. And then you start to listen to this rolling, rolling sins of the tongue. Lying, gossiping, slander, harsh words, insults, sarcasm, critical speech. The Lord detests lying lips. A perverse person stirs up conflict. Gossip separates close friends. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is for the building up of others according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. Sins of the tongue. In your interaction with people, are they benefiting from you? Wow. Sins of worldliness. Do not love the world or anything in the world. For anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. There's another guy who wrote another book. His book is called The Man in the Mirror. And men, if you want a good read, women, if you want a good read as well, you can get Patrick Morley's book called A Man in the Mirror. And he writes this, We can add, he writes, that there's a misconception, a misconception in the Christian life that we can add Christ to our life but not subtract sin. 
I'll read that again. We, the misconception is that we can add Jesus to our life, but we cannot subtract sin. Read the Old Testament. What is the Old Testament about? About, about a whole group of people that, at, that added God to their life, and yet they adopted the ways of the world. God kept bumping, 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 and excommunicated them from the world because why? They wanted to do both. They wanted to live in the world and live for God. You can't add Christ to your life and continue in the ways of the world. It is a change in belief without a change in behavior. It is revival without reformation, without repentance. You cannot not say, I follow Jesus and live in sin. An open, constant rebellion against the way of God. It just doesn't produce fruit. Back to the text. And he told them a parable. There was a man who had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. A, a fig tree, well, I'll look one more verse. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have been coming and seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Now cut it down. Why should it? Use up the ground. The man says, sir, let it alone. Let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put some manure fertilizer around it. And then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The fig tree has been around for years. It takes a couple of years from the time the fig tree goes as a seed, comes up, starts to grow. It takes a couple of years before it even should expect some fruit. And then every year after he should have expected some fruit, the, the farmer went out, fig tree, went out and looked for fruit on the fig tree. It found none. The next year it came when it was fig season, looked out, it found none. The next year it came out, the farmer came out and looked for fruit on the fig tree. It found none. Church, if God looks at your life, how long have you been walking with him? What is the fruit of repentance in your life? Is there fruit of repentance in your life? Is God finding fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control in your life? He's been walking with him. You've been walking with him for years. What's the fruit? I know that that's a picture and a connection between Israel and, and Jesus is, is talking and, and, and both it's in fruit tree, a fig tree inside a vineyard. There's a ton of stuff around it. I know that. But church, let's not get distracted by that. God is expecting, if you will, demanding the fruit of righteousness and holiness and godliness from you. Who sinned? Bad thing happened. Who sinned? This man or his parents? The sure test of quality changes the heart and have permanent effect. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, an old preacher from back in the day, he writes this. He says, by their fruits you shall know them. As it is applicable in the right method of judging ourselves, as of judging others. Whatever, therefore, may they have been in their inward experience, whatever joy or sorrow we may have felt, unless we bring forth fruit, meat, or repentance, our experience will not profit. Repentance is incomplete if it leads to confession and restitution. Repentance is not complete unless there is restitution, unless it causes us to forsake not merely the outward sins which others notice, but those lie on the inside, unless we make the choice to serve God and not live for ourselves. There is no duty which is either more obvious in itself or more frequently asserts the word of God. There is no duty greater than that of repentance. Part 2. Part one, 
story. There, there are some people that were killed by Pilate while they're offering sacrifice. Jesus points it to them needing to repent. Part one, there's an accident that happened. 18 people were killed by a tower falling on them. And Jesus makes it and transitions into us who need to repent. We need to be the ones who repent. It should be part of our daily lives. In a moment, we'll get to how to do that. We'll continue because I think that this is a really good story. I think that Luke did a fabulous job at connecting the Holy Spirit through Luke, connecting this story, the act of repentance. Now there, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disability, who had a disabling spirit for 18 years, and she was bent over, and she could not fully straighten herself. We had this gal, some of you will remember her, Adela Perryman. Adela Perryman, you know, as she got older and older, she kind of shrank. And in my mind, I'm envisioning her because sometimes she would list to the left or list to the right. I can't figure it out. And I'm just imagining God coming up and touching her. And when she was alive, just her standing straight up. And she was fully bent over. And then Jesus saw her. He's in the synagogue. It's on a Sabbath day. And when Jesus saw her, he said to her, woman, you're freed from your disability. Does this go over well with the Jewish leaders? No. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, he was indignant because Jesus had healed in the Sabbath. Look what he does. He said, the people. He wasn't going to talk to Jesus. He wasn't going to stop Jesus. But maybe the people would stop bringing their lame selves into the synagogue. There are six days in which you can work, can be done. Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. People, do not come in here sick. How dare you come in here? Don't come in here crippled. Don't come in here sad. Talk to him on Monday or Sunday. Don't come into church sick. Oh. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrite. Uh, uh, Jesus just calls him on the carpet. Does each of you on the Sabbath un not, wait, wait. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox and his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water? You've got a donkey and, or you've got an ox. Don't you at least untie it and say, go get something to drink. And, and they walk into the water and, and it, take it back so it can eat and it can get the water. And ought not this woman, the daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from its bond on the Sabbath day? Should this not be a day of rejoicing in the freedom of being released from the bonds of Satan? And I say that of our repentance. Should this not be a day in which they praise the Lord, I am free. God has forgiven me through Jesus Christ. I, I, I repent and I'm accepting. I'm changing my ways. I'm celebrating what God has done. Isn't that not what we should do? On Sundays? Instead, don't bring your sorry self that's sick to church. He said these things to his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things done to him. Don't be a religious hypocrite. Whole list of 12 different things we talked about. All of those sins that we struggle with. Don't be talking about somebody else's sin when you've never dealt with those sins in your life. You continue to live in them. You continue to embrace them. You continue to brag about them. Continue to share them. And yet you start castigating and getting mad and belittling other people. Church, let's not be hypocritical. Let's be honest with God in our repentance. You need to take an honest look at yourself. Are you the problem? Think of the relationships that you have with others. Are you the problem? What do you need to own? What do you need to stop? What do you need to confess? What do you need to repent of? Application. Four things. One, identify an area where you've accepted a respectable sin in your life. Just identify it. I had a whole list of them. The Lord spoke to you. Identify an area where you had a sin in your life. 
then put some scriptures in and say, God, I'm sorry. Admit it. Let's confess it. Move it in your heart. Then we've got to change. Cultivate an intentional prayer life. Identify. Replace that. Continually feed yourself scriptures. Cultivate an intentional prayer life. And finally, involve other believers in the process of repentance. So this morning, this is what I was going to do to close it. I'm going to close my eyes. I want everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. And then if you have something you need to repent of, just raise your hand. I'm not going to look. No one around you is going to look. Just raise your hand, and I'll pray for us because there are things in my life I need to repent of as well. The quietness of the room, no one looking. I'm not looking, no one else. Lord, you see the hands. You know the hearts. Lord, you have washed them all clean. You have forgiven them because of what you have done on the cross for them. Lord, you have cleansed them. You have made them holy. They are righteous. They are noble. Lord, they reflect you. Thank you for what you have done them through your death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, thank you for forgiving us of our sin. Lord, I pray now that since they have admitted and they know that their heart has offended your heart, Lord, I pray for every single one of us that we would change direction, that we would walk in a manner worthy of you. Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to just lay our sins on you. To just give you those things that you find offensive. Say, God, I want to change. I pray, Lord, for those people who raise their hands, if they need to confess it to somebody else, that they would have the courage to have someone hold, hold them accountable, Lord. If this is an issue of their heart, that they would have the courage to make the willful decisions to change those things. Thank you, Jesus, for speaking to us this morning. It is in your precious and wonderful and glorious name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you very much for watching. There are just a couple of steps that we want you to take. And if you have your phone with you, just scan the QR code. Or if you're watching on your phone, simply tap on the link. The link will take you to a couple of things. One, a place to donate. It's always important that we're faithful in giving back to God. If he has blessed us, we're blessed to be a blessing. So we would ask you to give generously to the church. Two, to connect with us. Let us know who you are. Let us know who you are. And three, how to pray for you. We love to pray for you. And so we, uh, I can testify I've seen God work miracles. And so we'd love to see and join in prayer for you. Also, we'd love for you to come and visit. So just make way and come on a Sunday morning and visit. That way you get to see the live version of it instead of the live stream version of it. And if you have any questions, feel free to text those as well. But make sure you, that you subscribe. That becomes important to us. And make sure that you also like this video. The more people that like the video, the more people it will reach. So thank you very much for watching and have a blessed day.